by Plato's Beard. We are all familiar with the story of William Shakespeare of Stratford and how he became the most celebrated poet and playwright of all time. Let's look at the Stratford argument using this text as a guide, Attacking Faulty Reasoning by T. Edward Damer. I'm using the fourth edition, which is in the gold border, but if viewers have a copy, I would urge them to get theirs and follow along if they can. The issue is about the misuse of logic. So let's look at the top 10 fallacies. For each one of the fallacies, I will give a definition of the fallacy based on Damer's book, whether or not it is prevalent in the 19th, 20th, or 21st centuries, and finally, how to counter it. Fallacy 1. Arguing from ignorance. This is the fallacy of arguing a claim is true or false because there is no evidence or proof to the contrary, or because of the opponent's inability or refusal to provide convincing evidence to the contrary. Since the 19th century, the argument has been, we know Shakespeare was a playwright and poet because doubters cannot disprove it. The task is for the claimant to make their case using sufficient evidence. If they will not, then an effective tactic would be to make an absurd claim such as, my brother-in-law is a Martian, then stating, you cannot disprove it, so it must be true, pointing out how their claim is equally unsupported and illogical. Two, insufficient sample. This is the fallacy of drawing a conclusion or generalization from too small a sample of cases. This fallacy is similar to using biased or unrepresentative data because in all cases, the entire picture is not looked at. Since the 19th or early 20th century, rather, hand D in the manuscript Sir Thomas More is Shakespeare's, and stylometrical analyses also do the same thing. Once again, the task is for the claimant to make their case using sufficient evidence. An effective response would be to use an outrageous example such as, all whites are racist, then formulating it into standard form to point out that this conclusion is equally as absurd as their own. For example, and I intend no disparagement of all the Harrys in the world, this is just an example. Harry is a racist. Harry is white. Harry is representative of all white people. Therefore, all white people are racists. Three, inference from a name or description. And this one's a very common one. In fact, I think this is where the Stratford argument started. This is the fallacy of Assuming that descriptive or identifying words or phrases attached to people or things constitute a sufficient reason for drawing conclusions about the objects to which the names or descriptions refer. In this case, the argument is, we know William Shakespeare of Stratford wrote the plays and poems because their title pages have his name on them. An effective counter is that you can point out the obvious. What if there were two William Shakespeare's, or what if the name on the title page was a pseudonym? Four, special pleading. 
This is the fallacy of applying principles, rules, or criteria to another person while failing or refusing to apply them to oneself or a situation that is of personal interest without providing sufficient evidence to support such an exception. The argument since the 19th century has been Shakespeare had a natural genius, so he did not have to attend university to learn Greek, French, Italian, law, or the other advanced subjects in his works. He also didn't have to know anything about courtiers and diplomacy or the inside workings of the court. It was his natural genius and imagination that did it. The most effective tactic to counter this is to accuse the opponent of using a double standard. You can also demand that they provide reasons why their example runs counter to real life rules or criteria. 5. Denying or ignoring the counter evidence. This is actually two definitions in once, but it is the same thing. The first is the fallacy of refusing to consider seriously or unfairly minimizing the evidence that is brought against a claim. The second is arguing in a way that ignores or omits any reference to important evidence unfavorable to one's position, giving the false impression that there is no significant evidence against it. Both are deck stacking tactics. Since 1920, the argument has been there is no evidence for De Vere, as being William Shakespeare, as strong as that for Shakespeare or Stratford. There are two ways to counter it. First, ask what kind of evidence they would need to see the counter argument. Second, ask if all relevant factors have gone into their argument. Refusing either request does not satisfy the rebuttal principle and shows a closed mind. The rebuttal principle is essentially knowing your opponent's argument and having effective responses to it which refutes that argument. This is also related to the paradox of belief perseverance in the face of new or contradictory information. Many people when faced with new and contradictory information against their worldview will automatically back themselves up against the wall and not accept it. Six, attacking a straw man. This is the fallacy of misrepresenting an opponent's position or argument, usually for the purposes of making it easier to attack. Since the 19th century, the Stratford counterargument has been, are you saying that a commoner could not have written the poems in plays? This is known as the snobbery argument. To counter it, you can restate your position as clearly as you can, correcting their misrepresentation. Or point out simply that the available evidence does not support Shakespeare as being capable of writing the plays and poems. Their own evidence indicates he was barely literate and not a writer. Put the onus back on them to prove their case. 7. Using questionable authority. This is the fallacy of attempting to support an argument by using the judgment of an authority who is likely to be biased in some way. Since the 19th century, there have been too many examples to note. You can ask your opponent what is in it for their authorities to state their claim is true. In other words, do they have a hidden or not so hidden agenda such as preserving their academic tenure, keeping lucrative publishing contracts intact, or maintaining an income perpetuating, perpetuating their hypothesis through speaking engagements. To be blunt, do their authorities make a living by promoting their stand on the issue? If the answer is yes, and they're committing many of the fallacies that we're going to discuss here, then I would say that the authority is biased and should not be used, as it is questionable. Eight, appeal to force or threat. This is the fallacy of attempting to persuade others of a position by threatening them with some undesirable state of affairs 
instead of presenting evidence for one's view. This tactic is often committed by professors in post-secondary schools. Since the late 20th century, James Sapiro and like-minded university and college instructors threatened students with expulsion or failure if they expressed doubt about authorship, even if they merely mentioned the topic once in class or a paper. To counter it, you have to expose the power disparity and take them to task to provide sufficient evidence why their position is true. If need be, report them to the school for unethical conduct. In other words, stick to the facts, don't make threats. Nine, red herrings. This is the fallacy of attempting to hide the weakness of one's position by drawing attention away from the real issue to a side issue. Since 1920, the Stratford argument has been, where are the manuscripts in Edward de Vere's hand? This is an example related to the fallacy of impossible precision. That fallacy is moving goalposts further and further back in an argument until it is almost impossible for a person to counter your argument. To quote Dom Damer, be prepared to explain how the issue has been sidetracked or why a certain issue is classified as a red herring. Finally, we have Ten, ad hominems and ridicule. I've combined them both because they actually have the same sort of attitude behind them. The first is the fallacy of attacking one's opponent in a personal and abusive way as a means of ignoring or discrediting his or her criticism or argument. The second is the fallacy of injecting humor or ridicule into an argument in an effort to cover up an inability or unwillingness to respond appropriately to an opponent's criticism or argument. Since 1945, Stratfordians have compared doubters to Holocaust deniers or those with schizophrenia and other me mental illnesses. This does a very great disservice to the severity and seriousness of the Holocaust, as well as people who suffer from mental illnesses such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Doing this sort of comparison actually diminishes that severity and reduces the seriousness of those subjects to the level of knowing who wrote plays and poems. Conversely, it is raising the level of the authorship question to the seriousness and severity of denying the Holocaust and suffering from mental illness. However, this is really a bad thing for the simple reason that you cannot effectively argue against it, except for to say, look to the facts. The way to counter it is to remind them of how unacceptable their ad hominem or ridicule is and to stick to the evidence. The trick is to never descend to their level, which is what they want you to do. Try to leave emotions out of it. The little graphic at the lower left hand corner is from illwillpress.com from the video in the YouTube link. Write it down, watch it, and you will know that the subject of his article or this little cartoon, Behavior on the Internet, relates directly to this logical fallacy. The website Oxfraud is full of logical fallacies, most particularly ad hominem attacks on prominent Oxfordians. This website should be avoided by anyone wanting to understand the authorship issue. The majority of posters are anonymous, yet prominent Oxfordians are regularly libeled by name. Under the guise of free speech, they can sometimes get away with it, but it hardly makes for good scholarship. Dr. Roger Strittmatter is one academic who has borne the brunt of their attacks and his rebuttals, rebuttals pardon me, are viewable online. 
The site's name should tip viewers off that the people behind it fear the case for Oxford is stronger than their own is for the Stratford man. The writers use every logical fallacy I've discussed and some not mentioned. And here is my warning. The overall tone of the site is one of ridicule and insults people who have legitimate doubts about the Stratford myth. Don't let fancy animations and graphics fool you. There is little value on the site unless you want an example of misguided energy and constant and tireless sarcasm. View at your own risk. Now I'm going to examine three Oxford screenshots, starting with The one about Contested Will, written by James Shapiro. Here is what they say about the book. James Shapiro's book, Contested Will, contains an excellent history of the so-called Shakespeare authorship question. I disagree. I've read it a few times, and I can say it with all honesty. Shapiro's book does not once address the facts in the authorship debate or provide a history of the issue. He does not provide any counter evidence to support his side. Instead, he attacks Delia Bacon and J.T. Looney, both are long dead, about their political and philosophical views. He admits at the beginning of the book he was not interested in facts, but in conducting armchair psychoanalysis. Here are his words. My interest is not in what people think, so much as why they think it and the emphasis is in the original. For two good critiques of the book, go to doubtaboutwill.org slash contested underscore will or brooklynrail.org slash 2010 slash 04 slash books slash absolute dash will. The second is a lengthy critique written by a respected and award-winning reviewer. Here is the handy comments page. Even the administrators note the peculiar removal of their hand D page. Is it because they have no real case and the hand D issue has been effectively rebutted many times? They say unusually for Oxford, the hand D comments pages are closed. And notice too that three of the links that they have begin with sarcasm and ad hominem attacks. That is hardly good scholarship, and it undermines their case from the beginning. Speaking of the beginning, this is their front splash page as it was in August of 2022. It's called the Prima Facie Case for Shakespeare, drafted by our legal team. Notice, however, that their legal team does not put their names on the page. If the case were so strong, wouldn't they have put their own names and links to the page so that they can defend their position? Why hide behind anonymity if the case is so strong? That brings me to the definition of prima facie. According to Thomson Reuters Practical Law Dictionary, prima facie is a Latin term meaning at first sight or at first look. This refers to the standard of proof under which the party with the burden of proof need only present enough evidence to create a rebuttable presumption that the matter asserted is true. A prima facie standard of proof is relatively low. It is far less demanding than the preponderance of the evidence, clear and convincing evidence, and beyond a reasonable doubt standards that are also commonly used. Now I'm going to present strike one against the prima facie case, straight from the definition and how it is applied. From sevensage.com is this, about burdens of proof. In increasing order, the three levels of burdens of proof are 
First, preponderance of the evidence, which means more likely than not. Next is clear and convincing evidence, which means highly likely. And last and the highest burden is beyond a reasonable doubt, which means that there is no reasonable explanation for what occurred other than that the defendant did it. Prima facie does not even meet the standards of proof anymore. Strike two. This comes from www.butlerprather.com on what is the clear and convincing evidence standard. They write, there are various types of evidentiary standards that can be applied in civil cases, including personal injury cases that determine the burden of proof. Preponderance of evidence, clear and convincing evidence, substantial evidence. As you can see, no legal sites recommend using the prima facie standard. Strike three. The closest term to prima facie is scintilla of evidence. Scintilla means very small. From Michael G. Carnavas.net comes these definitions. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt effectively means near certainty. Clear and convincing evidence means that a party must persuade the fact finder that the claim or defense is highly probable. Preponderance of evidence, also known as balance of probabilities, is satisfied when there is a greater than 50% chance that the proposition is true. Finally, scintilla of evidence is some evidence which falls far below preponderance of evidence. This standard is required of the accused when raising a specific defense in some common law systems. It is more than a scintilla, yet of course the amount need not be so substantial as to require, if uncontroverted, a directed verdict of acquittal. That last little bit he quoted from a law case. <clears throat> Here is the definition of scintilla from defensewiki.ibj.org. A scintilla is the smallest amount of evidence possible. Rarely used in criminal law, scintilla is the standard used in some courts for denying the plaintiff a restraining order. If the prima facie standard is not even used, why bother using it? Here is the bottom line. The Stratford case rests on insufficient and or dubious evidence and by making many illogical inferences from the name. They also dismiss, deny, or ignore counter evidence nearly all the time. Without a proper biography behind the name, what they have left is an empty shell of a man with no legitimate claim to authorship. Here are some links that show the logical fallacies of Stratfordians at work. In the interest of fairness, I begin with a YouTube link to a debate between Alexander Woe and Sir Jonathan Bates so that viewers can understand the Steinberg review of the video presented in the second link. The third link is to the PBS Frontline program from 1989, The Shakespeare Mystery. If you watch it, pay particular attention to A.L. Rowe's segments with regard to what we have found in this video. An Hour with Wells and Edmondson is a transcript of an interview made by Oxfordians. And note that at one point, the interviewers criticized fellow Oxfordians for not addressing some of the points made in the Stratfordian book, Doubt About Will. Here are some consequences for making those illogical fallacies.
they have to ignore modern analysis that pay, has more questions than answers. These websites all present information called from the Shakespeare canon, which shows an advanced knowledge of these subjects, astronomy, science, philosophy, the four humors, medicine, and law. While you may not agree with all of the conclusions on these sites, the quotes are exact and come directly from the Shakespeare plays and poems. They have to dismiss previous scholarship. In order to, be, to defeat the strongest candidate for authorship, they have to dismiss or ignore previous Shakespearean scholars whose conclusions, findings, and doubts weaken their position. Frank W. Wadsworth, Edmund Malone, and Sir George Greenwood all pointed out how the legal expertise found in the plays is accurate and of the period. Sir Sidney Lee, the preeminent scholar of the late 19th and early 20th century on Shakespeare, claimed that Edward de Vere's poems were the closest match to that of Shakespeare. Henry Clay Folger, the founder of the Folger Shakespeare Library, also expressed doubts about authorship and questions during the latter period of his life, though you will never hear that from the Folger staff at all. They ignore original research made closer to the period. They ignore findings made by Shakespeare scholars more than 300 years ago, such as Edmund Malone and his discovery of classical allusions and references, and George Stevens, who said that he was convinced the letter to the great variety of readers in the first folio was written by Ben Jonson. My video, his, wit, his book, is, I believe, also goes into that a little bit. They have to ignore the work of legal experts. Some of these scholars supported the standard myth, yet wrote on Shakespeare's extensive legal knowledge. Davis, Prague, and Collins were American. Sir George Greenwood and John Campbell were British. Tom Renier, the late Tom Renier, he was also an American and he lectured extensively on legal topics at Yale University and wrote papers on the authorship issue. All of them pointed out again the extensive legal knowledge that Shakespeare exhibits in his works. Another consequence is that they have to ignore books that pose more questions than answers. <clears throat> These titles have issues which should make readers think, yet the academic world in general ignores or dismisses them. Puzzling Shakespeare is the only Stratfordian work I know that tackles the issue of the Drosout engraving. While she doesn't come to the same conclusions that many doubters come to, she tantalizingly moves towards it in her chapter on the Drosout. The novel by Charlotte Armstrong, Seven Seats to the Moon, published in 1969 and since republished by Ms. Mysterious Press, contains a very interesting little throwaway scene in which the protagonist's father shows him an interesting puzzle in the dedication to the reader. That is where his wit, his writ, comes from. Shakespeare in Medicine is another book that asks questions and examines the extensive knowledge of medicine found in the plays. Shakespeare Identified, published by J. Thomas Looney and first published in 1920, identifies Edward de Vere as the most probable candidate for authorship. Yet I know of no Stratfordian that has rebutted effectively all of the points made in this book. The Shakespeare Guide to Little Italy by Richard Paul Rowe traces the entire 
route of Italian sites through the plays and shows that every one of them existed or it does exist today. Finally, Shakespeare's unorthodox biography by Diana Price points out a glaring flaw in the Stratford argument. It's in the form of a literary paper trail, which does not exist for Shakespeare, but it does exist for at least two dozen other well-known playwrights and poets of the period. They make an echo chamber of their field. To maintain their myth of the commoner made good, Shakespearean scholars have created a multi-generational echo chamber within their discipline. C. E. Tai Noin says in a, in a paper on the problem of being inside an echo chambers is in an echo chamber, outside voices are discredited. A.L. Rose and Stanley Schoenbrown are two late scholars whose shadows loom very large over these other scholars in terms of research. It is also an epistemic bubble. Again, from the problem of living, of living inside echo chambers by knowing an epistemic bubble is what happens when insiders aren't exposed to people from the opposite side. Here we see Bonnard Cutting, the late David McCulloch, Alexander Woe, Walter Hurst, Brian Wildenthal, and Dr. Earl Showerman, all Oxfordians who have presented very strong cases. And yet, the people inside the epistemic bubble by the <coughs> problem, pardon, ignore them. They dismiss them, and they even force their students to do the same thing. Should I add that there is also an underground group of orthodox scholars who are doubters, yet fear for their careers should their doubts come out into the open? They misunderstand the nature of creativity. Here's what James Warren says in his book, Shakespeare Revolutionized, published just last year. Having got Shakespeare wrong, Stratfordians misunderstand the entire process of literary creativity. They have been reduced to arguing that Shakespeare was an idiot savant who knew all these things. Italy, the law, courtly pursuits, diplomatic and political matters, as well as deep insights into human nature, not because of his experiences in life or his learning but because of we, he was a genius who imagined it all. That's not the way the human mind works. Effectively, Warren is describing special pleading. They become tongue-tied by authority. By thinking that it takes an unparalleled natural genius to write great works, I believe that many Stratfordians limit themselves to using external experiences and ideas in their fiction and drama, expecting that somehow their words will be remembered in 400 years if they merely use their imaginations in the right way. Instead of pursuing the truth, they maintain a dangerous fiction. In Shakespearean studies, the mainstream scholars ignore the truth and become enamored of perpetuating their mythos at the expense of clear evidence that contradicts their story. This can and does spill over into other fields of inquiry, such as the soft sciences, sciences, where evidence is filtered through theoretical lenses and not looked at objectively. Scholarship becomes a political exercise. Here is some pertinent advice for all of us from beloved TV detective Henry Crabb, played by the late Richard Griffiths. In season two, episode seven of Pie in the Sky, Swan in His Pride, he tells a young constable, police have to play the long game. 
It's sheer, dull application that finds out your man. We have to persist. It's the only way. You have to persist, miss nothing, and don't let your head down. One final word about this video and what it's presented. Even doubters of the Stratford myth can make the same logical fallacies. What we have to do is ensure that we don't make as many of them or as serious numbers of them as the Stratford people. Thanks for watching. Don't miss the Elliot and Valenza case coming soon. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>